supervisor. She's gone, that guy. You guys have riders? I don't know if I have lunch. Oh, I have a rider here. It's supposed to be at 9 o'clock, so maybe we'll wait for some of and we'll go out and do a Firefighter for us. Maybe the girl that's pregnant in the car is a firefighter too for us. Didn't have that fire station. No, that's the line. That's what you call the line. The good thing is she's not married to a firefighter. How's that? <laughs> what are some things that you should see coming? Did you see that coming? Saw this one. Sorry. What are some things that gets us in trouble at that fire station? Dangerous situations, safety violations, mental health issues, disgruntled employees, personnel problems, attitudes, the headline test. We talked a little bit about it, but does Facebook get us in trouble? Well, here we are. Here's engine 27. <laughs> <laughs> Is engine 27 in here? <laughs> so what do you think they did? They went and got the truck washed. <laughs> After they washed the truck, they wanted to do what? Take a picture. Now the guy that was the young company officer said he knew what? He had that feeling in his gut that this just isn't good. But he decided anyway to do what? Oh yeah, let it ride. It's kind of like that girl. As soon as I popped that girl up there, everybody had that same feeling of, is that trouble? Yeah, I could see that walking in the station. This one here, he thought to himself, yeah, this isn't going to be good. It got posted in a, I would say, an alternative lifestyle magazine along with online there. And it took about a nanosecond for someone else. We don't know how they found it to find it. The problem is, who did they send it to? After the media, to the, to, well, no, the city council, but to the mayor. And if you think about complaints today, and in the past, if you had to file a complaint with the fire department, what did you have to do? Go back about 15 years. Go to the chain of command. You can pick up. You have to search for the numbers of the fire department. Call the fire department. Today, how can you put a, a complaint? Anonymous. Anonymous. We have the integrity line that actually it was for employees to, to, to do on other employees, but now it's open. You don't have to leave anything. So anybody can make an accusation out there. I can email the mayor, every one of the council members, the fire chief. There's just multiple ways that if somebody observes something, it may not be even somebody getting treated. Just that, hey, I drove by and I saw these firemen taking care of them, and they looked inappropriate. And it comes back into, into the system on that. How do we manage Facebook and stuff? I think, unfortunately, we have to attempt to do it through policies. And sadly, you know, I wish that we could do it through just, uh, yeah, common sense or an attitude about it. Um, but I guess we're so big that that's hard to get everybody on the same page. What do you, what do you see that that's posted that's out there that's inappropriate? Yeah. <laughs> 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 On that one there. Well, I think you're gonna have a different answer from everybody. I mean, that's an issue that I see is uh, inappropriateness 
could be different to each person that's in here. Something that I think is not inappropriate or not a bad symbol of the fire department, somebody else very well can take it as that and uh, file a complaint. So on your personal thing, what do you have to make sure you're not represented? Is it, you'll read in, um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name, he has a, a thing that was on there before. Most of the members or fire department members that have been terminated have gotten their jobs back over Facebook type stuff because of the First Amendment right of being able to do that. The people that haven't gotten their, their jobs back mostly is because when they did a post, who were they representing or who did they say they were representing? Fire, fire, fire department. So the things that you do off duty, the things that you put on there, there's one that's going on right now where there was a, um, it was just up the road here in Charlotte, which will be a very interesting one to watch as far as what you have as far as your personal views on stuff versus something where you put a post where you're standing in front of a fire engine or you have anything that says the, the Greensboro Fire Department or a t-shirt or even a station shirt or even if the, the 27 and people know that 27 is something that the fire department members, you're representing the fire department at that point in time. So for some people, they're out there posting and they feel that, hey, I've got the right to be able to post their stuff. And yeah, you do. You can post a lot of stuff out there. But what can't you do? You can't represent that you're representing the fire department. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Chief, you had a comment? No, I was going to say exactly. We have a lot of civilians that wear our <laughs> shirts. So they do things. <laughs> We have, I mean, everybody wants to wear a Phoenix Fire Department ball cap or different things that are out there. And, and on the other side, we sell shirts. We don't sell large, but the only thing that we've had really good control on is the Phoenix Fire Department shirt with Phoenix Fire Department on the back of it. But the union has shirts that look exactly like ours, but say Phoenix Firefighters instead of Fire Department on it. So you're exactly right. And we have to respond to every one of those and say, We've gone through, we've looked at the picture, and we've identified that this is not a member of the department. Any other things on Facebook? What did y'all do in this situation? Told not to do it again. Not do it again. Don't do it again. Hazen's become, you know, the term hazen or whatever's really come to limelight. And uh, personal experience. Somebody may think something's hazing and uh, outside of the fire department culture, whereas we do not recognize that. Somebody uh, passing a promotion test and getting wet, that's not hazing. Or I don't feel like it is. And if the person doesn't feel like it, then it's not. <laughs> wow, your standards are up there somewhere. Not no wet, but if that person under or, or doesn't feel offended by it, uh, you get into a situation where we don't feel that it's wrong to post that and somebody outside the fire department culture feels it is offensive to them and they contact the city manager's office or whatever and it, it rolls downhill from there. So it, it's hard for me if I don't it's hard for me to not see a Definitive line, I guess, it is what I'm saying. Well, like this, what if it would have been a prostate cancer car wash? There would have been guys in the shorts. And what would have been like that? So that would have been no problem you want to be, whatsoever. If you want to say there's no difference between the gender issue, then let's be, let's, let's say, hey, there's no, nothing wrong with that. But that's the other side of it that I can see. So, yeah. so what is being wet? I mean, somebody gets you with a water can. A uh, five-gallon bucket of water being dumped on you. If the guy that's getting wet is Can you offended. defend that in front of 12 peers, in front of a jury? Let's say that, that somebody put it, and that's kind of a bad example. Whatever we do, we have to be able to defend it as it's an acceptable within our culture. And that the group that you're, you're out there looking at it and then are judging you, because they're going to judge you on what they feel is appropriate or not as appropriate. So that, you're, you're exactly right, because putting that water onto it, I think in the fire service and the culture, that's a pretty common thing. Um, we used to do with open cabs, we used to turn the stain gun around, mm -hmm. and somebody would jump up in the back, you'd have the engine in, in, in gear, and you just tap that gas real quick, and you just douse them. 
because they weren't paying attention. And it was, it was a part of that, that. Now, if someone says, hey, stop it, what do I have to do? Stop it. I need to be able to stop it. It is just part of being, you have to be able to defend your actions when you're out there. If you're looking at something and you're saying, I'm going to have a hard time defending that, don't do it. As far as putting it, and you did you did something, it's a culture here, it's an acceptable culture, a portion of it, is that you get promoted, that they, they, they do that to you, or they have um, some different uh, kind of little things for you. But some of the stuff don't screw with, someone said don't screw with someone's gear. We are really bad at screwing with each other's food, and that went really bad for Los Angeles, for screwing with people's food. And we've had incidents in Phoenix where people have done stuff for lotto tacos and for lotto burritos and doing some things that have gone bad, that we've had to change our culture and say, don't screw with people's gear, don't screw with their personal stuff, don't screw with food. And that was hard because it, if you, if in most stations, large stations, Station 30 has 18, 18 members there. And you know if they're cooking tacos or there's something that's coming out, you better be checking your food. And that was just part of it. You, you went and you sat down and you, you, when we used to have fish fry, you'd take and look for the sponge and see if you got the sponge and stuff. But it, it got out of, it got to a point that someone said, stop it. And we realized it was out of bounds and we had to start saying that. I don't think the 12 peer thing is such a bad example because now with the Sue Happy Society that we live in, every call or shady thing you do is a potential lawsuit. So you have to look at... So I wasn't going to bring it up, but... We have a, a culture in our department which is called cock and ball, which is there's a piece of paper and I'll go inside here and I'm going to draw a little picture on the inside of this here if everybody can remember what it's going to look like. And it has been, I mean I can remember the first time I was at somewhere and I opened something up and was like, who the hell put that in my stuff? And on lockers, uh, on a pickle jar, that there's a pickle, there's all of a sudden a little drawing that would come up onto that portion of it. Um, there's actually a pickled, uh, pickled something t-shirt, that pickled eggs t-shirt, if you can imagine a pickled eggs, two eggs and a, and a pickle type deal. I'm getting there with you, right? and I? And for the most part, it was pretty funny until one person felt that he was being picked on and then told them to stop and they didn't. What'd they do then? Yeah, they, got worse. they got worse and kept on drawing it and drawing it. And so he had a lawsuit. We went to the 12 people and what did the 12 people say? They're a bunch of idiots. Think about how we looked in the paper when that came out because they said, uh, and we thought we could defend it. That's the best thing. I mean, we're going back a few years. We're all, this is Chief Rudy City. Oh, this is part of our culture. We can defend this. This is what we do, and this is appropriate. We lost big time. Now, looking back upon it and, and the changes, even 12 years ago, that, that behavior is just inappropriate. So that's where I started with the, with the 12. At the end of it, if it goes bad, that's who's going to be judging on whether this moves forward. The settlement side of it, we did a settlement, went with all of our lawyers, sat down, they went through each person and identified who we thought was going to be a good witness, who was going to be a bad witness, and they came back and said, oh, you guys just need to settle. One is you're going to pay more money for lawyers' fees than you are going to be over here. That, that became a business decision, but at the same time, you just look stupid. These two are dating and they can't get along and he's crawling through the ceiling and stealing phones and Shoot, are you guys still in high school or what? Plus, as being the assistant chief in charge of personnel sitting in front of the council and the mayor trying to explain it. And so, so again, it probably is probably pretty good to be able to say that thing. Here's some stuff here. <coughs> kind of move forward through a few things here. You have most of these in here. Jamie Sreda is live to tell us how the high tents mean a change in the way Phoenix fire crews have to do business. Jamie? Hey, Carolyn, the fire sparked here around 5 
o'clock tonight, and even though it's evening, it was still hot out here. In fact, right now it's 99 degrees, and when the temps hit triple digits, that's when firefighters go to overdrive. <laughs> when it's dry heat. It's very hot when you're fighting a fire. It does seem like we have more fire than some Watch fire. in the background and see what you guys see in the background. Meaning firefighters know how to play the game of beat the heat. Dressed in 100 pounds of gear, they tackled this fire at 12th Street in Echo as temperatures rose to a 2014 high of 107 degrees. The number one thing we do is we'll start to add more resources to some of those calls. So when you're driving around or you see a house fire, we might have an extra one or two engine companies there just for what we like to call manpower. That helps the guys rotate in and out safely so they can stay healthy for their full shift. Getting fire also calls an extra support. Basically a shade area. Uh, we bring icy cold water to them. Sometimes they have birds. We have some plants that will mist and air on them. You know, you got harassment on that one. The garage, and luckily everyone got out okay. But whenever firefighters show up to a call, they're now in high temps, they're ready for a long fight in the heat. So we are used to it because we do it so often. Phoenix Fire worked in an apartment fire today where they brought in a couple of city buses for people to place. That's why residents could stay cool while firefighters address their needs. Back to you. Did you guys see anything strange in the video? <clears throat> What were they? No turnout coats, but what were they wearing? They're paying. SCBAs. Why are we doing that? So if you looked at what was going on, red hats are who? Captains. If we look at, at our retirees, what's killing our retirees? Is cancer. So this one's about being a responsible leader. For, for most of us on here, except for the chief here, where was the SCBA when you started? <coughs> in the back of the truck. In the back of the truck. Yeah. In the case. Did you wear them? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And we said to them, we need you all as leaders in the department to make a change. And so I had actually had a friend from Illinois that when this was on one night, he was out visiting. He goes, man, look at that. And, and what had happened was exactly what we see here, is that what we want to do is limit that exposure and change the department. And so as leaders in the department, we looked at this past year again and went back through and reviewed through this and said, are we doing what we said? And what we did is we brought everybody in and said, we want to make a difference in the department. Now, we know that the exposure, where's some other exposure at? Because I got beat up on showing this little thing. On his skin, the neck. One of the things that, that uh, we're really good at, I think, do you guys have a, a cleaning program for your turnouts? You clean your turnouts? You didn't think we were going to talk about cancer. Do you clean your hoods? How often? Same time. What we're looking at or what they're telling us is that one of the biggest exposures that we have is every time we put that hood on. And that hood is dirty. So we're looking, right now one of the trucks that you saw is a utility. So it comes out, fills up the bottles, and then it, and you don't have to carry a bunch of bottles. It does it right there uh, with, the, with the thing on it. Is every fire you go to, they just give you a new hood. They go back and they'll wash the hoods. Because right now we all have our hoods. We've got our name on our hood and we keep it in the same spot. But to reduce that exposure is we're looking at just buying a bunch of them, sticking them in there in a the dirty bag in the, in the utility truck. When you come out, he gives you a new one, you go back in. We've done a really good job of cleaning our gear and stuff, but we haven't done a good job of taking care of our hoods. 90% of the negative stuff can or won't happen if we act like a boss. You guys have said it today, we lead by example. A lot of what we do every day is just coaching. Great communication, including listening, address issues immediately, be corrective, be nice. Someone asked about that, that, that uh, Facebook post, what did we do with him? That captain had absolutely beaten the hell out of himself, so there wasn't much that we could do to him that he hadn't already done to himself already. A lot of what we do every single day is above the bar. We do a little bit of management off the bar, and all we need to do is kind of push them back up. Two basic problems, safety violations, harassment, those issues. Stop them right away. Once we stop them, what's, up, what's our advantage? We've got, a, we've got some discretionary time. Do you guys have a mentor? You don't have to raise I kind of threw that out there. In our department, one of the things that we push really hard is, is, is somebody that you feel confident in, that you can call up and that you can talk to. Uh, it can be someone that's a close friend to you. It can be your boss, the relationship with your boss, someone in the personnel department, the union, some other member that's on the job. But for a lot of these things, the ability to talk to somebody, once you've stopped it, and then be able to talk, say, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. How's your relationship with your boss? And again, you don't need to think about it. How often does your boss come by and see you? Or if you are the boss, some of you guys that are, that are chief officers in there, how often are you seeing your companies and, and truly sitting down with them, not just the portion of, hey, I'm coming by. Some places I know, I don't know if you have to make your stations every day or how you deliver, some places deliver mail. Uh, but training, interaction, what is that relationship? If something bad is happening, do, you, I, th do I feel that that, that <coughs> company officer is going to give me a call and, and tell me what's going on in the station? Uh, as a BC, I learned very early that the, the places I felt most comfortable going to, my stations that were out there, and I'd go and have dinner with them or have lunch with them or we're training and running calls, were really not the places that I needed to spend my time. Uh, the places I needed to spend my time were the stations that were, were challenges for me. Uh, one of them was a guy as a captain, his name's Dave Sanchez. He's a captain at Engine 17. He was a captain at Engine 17 before I even came on the job, and he is still there. And the first day I went there, he says, I was here long before you come, and I'll be here long, be long after you leave. I said, you're absolutely right, but I'm here today. <laughs> So we, each chief has a driver. I don't know, do you guys have a driver? I'm looking at the chiefs. No. My driver absolutely hated him. And so every time I was, we were going to go over there for lunch, he would be, and he planned, to be honest, he would plan like meals, things like that was like his, his thing as far as being my driver. So I'd say, okay, we've got to go to 17th, you know, for lunch or for dinner, you pick. 
and he'd absolutely get mad. F him, I don't want to go over there, that's no fun. <laughs> he'd go and look in the thing and he was off. Oh, Dave's off, we can go over there. <laughs> no, we need to be able to go over there. The great thing that happened was is that he, he had a person that came in and that was having a meltdown in the station. And he felt comfortable to be able to call me and say, man, I need some help. I'm not real, I'm not real sure what to do. And to me, that was a success. Him and I aren't fishing buddies. We'll never be fishing buddies. But at least he felt comfortable that when something bad, to be able to, to, be able to call me. If anything, build on your relationships, work with other people, work through each portion of it. Before we do the second half here, I'm going to show you a video. We had a, a young firefighter, his name's Brad Harper, was killed uh, in the summer of 2013 at an event. And it kind of ties all the stuff that we've been talking about together on being a good boss, being a good supervisor, and why it's so important what we do every single day. And what we do... Because if you look at the event there, some decisions were made. And we made this video to be able to share it with everybody. On May 18, 2013, firefighter Brad Harper died as a result of a backing accident while operating at a fire call in South Phoenix. Phoenix Fire, Phoenix PD, and OSHA all conducted investigations into his line of duty death. In the following animation, we've paired the apparatus movements with the radio traffic to reconstruct what happened that day. After the animation, you'll see the findings of the investigative team. Command Agent 14, you'll be working in the south sector, which is Engine 39. Command the unit stage on 39th Avenue in Miami. Engine 21. That's right, Engine 5 and 12. I need to start coming down Miami. I'm going to have Engine 24 meet you. And they're going to uh, continue to plug. Command 
Kathy responding will have them expedite before traffic control 39 Jackie and Lower Buckeye. Fire Department findings. After an extensive review, this committee finds the following. Contrary to Phoenix Fire Department procedures, Engine 24 was not utilizing a backer as they backed north on 39th Avenue. Firefighter Harper was likely concentrating on donning his turnouts and did not act to direct Engine 24 or move out of the way. Engine 24 speed in reverse was not excessive. Phoenix Police Finding. This collision is a result of the operator of Engine 24 not perceiving or reacting appropriately to Rescue 21 as Engine 24 backs <clears throat> northbound. Contributing to the collision is a lack of perception and timely reaction to the closely approaching Engine 24 by the dismounted pedestrian firefighter and the lack of a designated backing assistant on the ground. When you listen to the, the, the tape, what do you, how do you feel the anxiety was on that fire ground? That was the tape. Controlled. Very controlled. Not, very, not a rush of, of anything going on. Um, the incident commander, is, is, it's actually his driver is running the fire. What we do is we'll switch. It's, it's a mentor thing. So you get to be the, the driver becomes the rider. And so he's running the fire. Uh, I've listened to this enough times. It's an exterior fire that's burning. It was burning towards. What did Ladder 24 come back and tell them, though, right, right during the Vega? Yeah, it had extended now to that metal clad. It's a huge old building that's back there. So now things were starting to go. It's in an annexed area, so water supply is always a tough, 
tough portion for us that's down there. Engine, um, it's real common for us is when you send an engine on, a, on an incident, the ambulance goes with them. We assign them together, so it's a four-person company, now it becomes a six-person company. And it's a manpower, they have SCBAs on them and everything. For most of the people that were experienced there, you guys heard it, is that the, the conversations, we need to get a water supply, it's going to take us a while, it was very slow. Uh, Brad's 23 years old, uh, had just came off of probation um, to work. What we do is the, is the guy that ran the May Day off of Rescue 21 is actually on the captain's list. So what an opportunity is, is that a captain can ride on an ambulance for overtime, 24 hours of overtime. So he's on the captain's list. He was very calm. We had gone through a bunch of May Day training. Um, what's that going to sound like, everything? He followed, he followed his training directly as, as we asked him to do. But having him there versus another one-year firefighter made a huge difference in that. Um, we talked about family type stuff. We had probably five sets of family. The, the South Deputy that went over there, his son was the captain on Ladder 24. Uh, there's two brothers, the captain on Engine 21 and the captain on Engine 6 were brothers that were there. Um, Brad's support group and, and a group of them, there were six of them from high school that went through high school and that all got hired in the same class and all came on together. It was a class of about... <coughs> 50 some people in there. So there was just a huge amount of people that knew who was on Rescue 21 and what was going on there. Everything that was going on, uh, one other uh, factor that was in this was that one of the firefighters on Engine 24 had three hours off on vacation. And we allow that up to, up to three hours you can take off. So they're running what we call running short with three of them. Engine 24 was just going to back up probably about I don't know, the T in the road and just back up and let engine 21 lay up to him. As they, as they turn the corner and he's going to back up, the firefighter says what? Let me back you up. What's the engineer say? I got it. I got it. Brad gets out, they pull the ambulance. We looked at the parking of it. He parked it pretty much right on the side of the street. He didn't get off to the side of the street. As it was backing up, we went back and checked. Um, they, they estimated the speed in the backing was about four and a half or five miles an hour. So he's just backing up real slow. Are, do we get um, sometimes our situational awareness? Do we work around apparatus that is backing all the time? Yeah, if we look at the, the academy, and I point to the chief, is that we function around apparatus moving, um, things happening on the fire ground. One of the ones that we don't know is how, how did he not see that coming back? But talking to some really smart people, talking to people in the military, is that we become somewhat just accustomed to that hazard. And, and is it a hazard even to us anymore? Not at all. <coughs> Came back, caught him right between there. The thought was is that he, he probably saw it coming and thought, hey, I can just lean into here. He had the building, the cabinet was big enough that he could have jumped into the to that portion of it and got out of the way, but he came back and it basically pinched him right between the two of them right there. But something really simple, do you think they had ever backed up without a spotter before? Yeah. And, and so I guess for that, that leadership portion of it or that supervisory that portion of it, and that's why, I mean, it's a tough video every time that I have to sit here and watch it. But if there's a lesson for us to be able to learn out of there, is there's a whole list of rules that we have that, that we follow every single day. And, and sometimes we choose not to follow those, those rules. And most of the time we think the risk is what? It's really low. Yeah, that, that risk for that, that's not going to happen. Um, I think it's hard sometimes being the supervisor. It's 2.30 in the morning. You pulled into an apartment complex. The engineer's just going to back it up. We're going to turn and go back out. The ambulance is there. They beat us to it. The reality is, is what do we have to do every time we're going to back up? We've got to have a backer. So take that and apply it to everything else that we do each and every day. And I, and I, and I said a little bit ago about, about rules and dealing with, with drugs and alcohol, how my tolerance has, has become very low on it. Um, after going through this, um, NIOSH, or not NIOSH, OSHA came in. OSHA gave us a, a, a fine of $78,000, which is the max
fine and said it was we did it willingly which means that basically this happens in your organization they went through and interviewed people and they asked them hey do you guys back up without spotters do you do other things the nice thing is OSHA said hey, if you spend all that money in training we won't take that money you spend it and we went out and built a um, driver training and talked about backing and, and stuff but spent a lot of time just talking about what things do we do during the day and why is it tough or why would it be tough or why would someone not get off an apparatus or what things why was it okay for that engineer to think hey I can just back up along here and violate that and it has a very positive arc our accidents have, have gone down to almost nil and you can imagine because of an event like this it had a huge impact back onto the department how do you think the captain and the engineer are doing though yeah exactly is it, it it took their whole life and turned their whole life upside down uh, both of them have been back to work and both of them have been off work type stuff um, each of them received a suspension and in our in our policy portion of it I don't I don't even we had to do um, some type of uh, disciplinary action to them um, but to them no matter what we could have demoted them or terminated them and what they're going through is ten times worse than anything else so we put a lot of words up there about being accountable and holding people accountable um, doing things that are right um, being a leader during that time um, I think it all comes together when you when you sit and you look at something like this and and sometimes it is tough being a supervisor but that's the job we signed up for 99 percent of the time it's absolutely great but being that person that's in charge no one wants right no one wants right following the rules and then every so often what we're we going to have to do you're going to have to pull them back in you're going to have to get them back online and you have to get them going straight again any questions about that incident or, or anything on that I was just impressed with how well your communication, your, your alarm, uh, not this much, sir. Uh, they were obviously lost the attack channel, but the, 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 the operations channel was performed uh, very nicely. We went, I went and had dinner with your chief last night, and, and um, one of the things we talked about was dispatch mm -hmm. and dispatch centers. Um, I've unfortunately had to manage our dispatch center and tech services and it is the biggest pain in the ass it's all civilians different shifts and everything else but it is probably one of the highlights of our department is the way that they respond and it, it, we just rotate it around it's, it's basically your turn but when you listen to them what they can do the way that they they don't uh, and i think yours is probably what police fire mixed together all of ours are just dedicated to fire so they, they don't have any other type deal so when we did RIC training and Mayday training, every single day, every dispatcher had to go through and do the radio side of it um, for 1,600 Maydays. Every single member had to go on the radio and, and do a Mayday and work their way through it. Every one of them had to be done through there. So, Thank you. Any other questions about the incident or the fire? Probably one of the hardest things. Um, they had, he had just been married about eight months. One of the things that I hadn't thought about was... Um, she, she, being a very young um, individual, has done okay, but uh, mom and dad. And mom and dad, he was the oldest of the family and still has kids in high school, has two cousins that are on the job, and it has been very difficult. They're very angry with the fire department. They're very angry with, with, with that, wanted their, their cousins to quit the job, a lot of, of problems kind of with that side of it, and the, the wife really um, kind of has moved on type thing. Did he die on scene or was it? Uh, they revived him on scene and they took him in, um, they revived him in the hospital. Um, he died probably about 18 hours later. How did you get him removed? Airbags. The Put two airbags on him, pushed him, pushed him apart, popped an airbag, had to drop another airbag in there. When they pulled them both apart, he fell straight down. We were able to pull them straight out underneath the apparatus then. If, uh, like you said, your accidents have gone down, but uh, if an engineer is caught or has an accident and there's no backer being used, what, I know the disciplinary action, but what, what level? 
So we pulled everybody in. This is for, up to me. This is using, not using the bike. It's probably one of the most serious things you can do while you're driving. And we've had several issues. With so our, our discipline is corrective, progressive, and lawful. And you have to follow a set set of stuff with the, with the city. So it always starts off with a verbal, then it goes to a written, it goes to a suspension and to the motion. And you can skip certain levels depending on the severity of it. So what we did as a department, the week after when we, get, we put everything together, we brought every member of the department that came to the training academy, we brought them in waves of 45 minutes. We brought them in, we sat down and said, this is what happened, this is what happened on the event, these are the circumstances around it, everybody has a verbal reprimand at this time. So the next step is you leave and you go out starts with written or suspension. So each one of them will depend on the event and what happened during that event then type stuff. So the very first one that we had uh, was a BC watched an engine back up about five feet and turn and go down a street and everybody got a written reprimand on that company. And we've not had another one since. Because when you drive a vehicle, accidents go out. Mm -hmm. But to choose, you're making a choice to be negligent and not using the biker. So I, I agree with you. Yeah, no, I mean, he, Pretty much the, the disciplinary side versus losing a member, we, we don't have that. The, our accidents have been clipping mirrors, some of, the, some of the clearance stuff now type things. Any other questions? This has been like quite uplifting. I didn't think it was going to go quite this well. <laughs> Another great uh, subject here. After seven months, a handful of Phoenix firefighters have lost their own lives. Not in the line of duty, but in a way many consider just as tragic. ABC 15 investigator Lori Jean Gleha reveals how they're dying and what we can all do to help. They are heroes. Every day fighting flames. They are fearless and courageous, rescuing complete strangers when no one else will. But you harbor a lot of stress on the person. <coughs> but what happens when it's one of our own who needs rescuing? It's the worst thing that could ever happen. It seems like families get hurt by all this. What happens when it's one of their own whose life is at stake? It's not fair. Should the fire department have stepped in sooner? I got to say goodbye, you know, and that's one thing, as much as it hurt seeing him like that, it was an opportunity that I do cherish. 35-year-old Phoenix firefighter Sean Johnson, a man whose job included saving lives, suddenly ended his own. I don't know how he got to where he was. For whatever turmoil that was tearing Sean apart on the inside, on the outside, he was a kind-hearted prankster, a musician, a military veteran, and an outdoorsman. Gone in an instant. Phoenix fireman Adam Cayazzo went through the fire academy alongside Sean. They became close buddies. Adam spoke at Sean's funeral. Our, like, hopefully this never happened to any of us. But it did happen again. Just three months later, two more Phoenix firefighters killed themselves in March and then April. One of them, a retired fireman, who told his son he was having trouble sleeping at home and planned to stop by the Phoenix fire station to get some rest. That was the day he killed himself. It's a wake-up call for, for all agencies. I never realized truly the hurt that's involved So it happens to you. And then in July, the East Fire Department suffered another loss. I miss him very much. 33-year-old Corey Nelson, a father of young children, killed himself too. I know because of how he was that he wouldn't have left his family like this because he cared about all of us. Four firemen, gone, ending their own lives. This is the fire station where Corey and Sean spent some time as Phoenix firefighters. First responders like them are at an even higher risk of suicide simply because of the unique stresses of the job. But there are other contributing factors, depression, substance abuse, finances, even relationship issues. Firefighters also told us there's a macho culture that can exist on the job. And that can make it difficult for these everyday heroes to reach out for help. What can be done to 
affect that culture, though, so somebody can feel comfortable to come forward. Probably the fire chief saying it's okay to ask for help. If, if, if I say that and I believe that, and it's good to be strong and it's good to be courageous, but it's also good to, to ask for help. Do you believe that when you say it? I do believe it. Well, I, you know, I, I, I thought the world was this Bishop. I want to close that. You know, I don't want to see one more, one more young person die needlessly. Phoenix Fire Chief Bob Kahn says he held meetings about the suicides with his captains, trying to educate his crews about suicide warning signs. The department already has an employee assistance program and a system called Friends Helping Friends, mostly aimed at helping people struggling with substance abuse. But it wasn't until Corey Nelson killed himself, the fourth suicide, that he formed a special task force focusing on what he calls a problem within the department. Should the fire department have stepped in sooner? If, if I could do something, it would put, put all these people back on fire trucks, I would do that. To second guess it, I would say that's probably not healthy for the community. The chief is looking forward now for ways to help his crews. Crisis experts say a person must be willing to reach out for help in order to get it. The problem, they say, in some cases, firefighters need something that trained professionals can't give them. They're going to go to a peer because they're the ones that they trust to say, you understand what I go through here on the job. It's a physically and mentally demanding job that right now requires a physical exam to be cleared for work in the field. Is there anything like that for mental health? I think there should be. Will you make that change? I think we're looking at how we do that. For the survivors, including retired Phoenix firefighter Steve Nelson, who lost his son Corey. He's probably looking down laughing at his soul now. <laughs> Telling me to get over it. Getting over it may never be possible, but making a change in someone else's life is. You're not alone. There's a lot of people out there that uh, will help you out and uh, seek it and embrace it and be, um, be positive about things. The new task force will be making recommendations for changes at the department in mid November, and we will be following up on that. We're also sending our story to the International Association of Firefighters to get their response about this issue, and we'll let you know what they say. I'm investigator Lori J. Liga, ABC 15 News. That was a pretty bad year for us as we went through and looked at, at our members and what's going on with them and kind of some of the struggles that were happening. If you look over the last six, probably about the last six years, what's happened in the economy? Middle class is getting squeezed. <laughs> Middle class is, is getting not squeezed. Going up. Financial strain. A lot of people have financial problems. A lot of people in homes that they couldn't afford. Does the job cause us a lot of stress? For a lot of people, what we found in our members, they said the job was what? What they like about the job? Away from home. But you're right, it is. It's a way that you could go. It's very structured. I know what I need. I need $12 to make it through today to buy lunch and dinner. I know what's going to happen as far as the calls. We sat down with labor management and went through and looked at uh, some, some recommendations from them. We looked at what's going on as far as the issue, life and job stressors. Some of the things that uh, we found really early on was that there's a lot of stuff that we didn't know that we thought we were doing a good job with our, our EAP program, but really weren't doing a very good job at it. Um, with this one here, they define 50% of people develop bills with some type of mental illness in their, in their lifetime. 25% have some type of mental disorder. 15% of adults consider suicide during a lifetime. And for every one suicide, there's 25 attempts. So we started looking at that and saying, hey, we've had four suicides. How many additional people that are out there are suffering? And why, did they, why were those people able to do that? What was going on in our system as far as the response to it? Did most of those people, except for, for the one retiree, and he was actually going by the, the airport station, Station 19, and visiting there, and they had a feeling that something was going on. With the other three, did the, did the members at the station have a, have, a, have a feeling something was going on? Most of them did. It was those same things as far as um, some drugs and some alcohol, attendance, 
some things that were going on. They kind of talked about it a little bit, but really hadn't been able to um, figure out what do I do, or really how do I manage it. We went through, we met 15 times in a little over three months. And what we found was as far as, as an organization, we had a lot of questions and a lot of things that we didn't know. And a lot of it was is that we realized that we're really good at firefighting, we've been spending a lot of, uh, of time being really good paramedics, but we haven't taken care of our members, and we haven't put time into that portion of it. And we said we're going to make, a, make an effort and, and move forward with it. Uh, we went to the IAFF, we went to the IFC with the National Fire, all the Firefighters and met with them. Uh, I don't want to say we were the catalyst to do it, but if you look, it's out there. Uh, suicides and mental illness and mental health has become a forefront of each one of those organizations moving forward. We had a lot of things. People would come in and we would sit and talk. These meetings would run for about four hours and we had a great attendance within our department of people coming in and saying different things about it's an impulse reaction and then what happens when you go to therapy? Do I sit on a couch? And we would actually just sit there and they would talk through each one of these things. And at the end of it we came out with some recommendations for moving forward within the department. Um, <coughs> we can look at this one here. You can see there's normal life stressors that happen. Again, in that 30-year career that you're going to go through, we're going to have some of these things that are going to happen to you. Probably one of the biggest things is that uh, on the firefighter side of it was the sleep portion keeps coming back, the ability to sleep. I know that when I left the field, I would take a nap every single day. And even though I always slept well at the station and stuff on my days off and stuff, I would take a nap. Once I came on, on to staff, what I found was is I didn't need a nap anymore. And so even though I thought I slept well at work, I really didn't. And the other thing is is that exposure and stuff. Probably each one of us has gone on thousands of calls. And we can't remember except for just those couple ones that will always pop up. And for some reason, they have those triggers that will pop up onto us that, hey, this call had, a, had an event. For the most part, it says up there, our ability to cope is really good because of what we do, the way that we're trained, the way that we respond. Our social system works very well in taking care of it. But every so often when we get outside of that, we need some more help to be able to, to get through it. Is it easy to ask for help? For most of us, it would yeah, no. We would like it to be. We would like, like it to be, but, it, but it, yeah, exactly. It's very difficult to ask for help. We looked at the thing. We wanted to increase our resources. We wanted to make the accessibility to it so that people maybe that didn't feel comfortable could go somewhere else to ask. We wanted to raise an awareness on it, reduce that stigma. And the last one on the bottom here is one that we're just now hitting on was that instead of waiting for a bad event to happen, is how do we build resilience in people? How do we build people up and how do we improve so that you don't have to access the system? Some of our recommendations is to uh, create a task force, a wellness committee. We've now transferred that into labor management does it together. We call it member services. They manage anything that happens with the members together. We've done department-wide wellness education. Um, every year we do some type of wellness education where you'll come in and get some type of information, the feel-good information. The, there's a bunch of different names that have come out of that portion of it, but it has been key for us that every single year we do some type of reinforcement back into the system. Um, we do, that's the reoccurring stuff that happens every single year. We'll look at uh, a website. I'll show you a website in which anybody can access. So if anybody wants to access the website, they can do that. One of the things that we learned very early on was that what we're leaving out was our families. And so somebody, you said it, was about having families involved, is that it is key that, that the families have an opportunity to say, hey, he may go to work and he seems really good at work, but at home things are absolutely terrible and I just don't know where to turn to to get any help. One of the biggest things that we found was financial education. Is old, young, all the way across there, the financial side of it is absolutely one of the biggest stressors. We had members that had multiple credit cards that were paying off one to the other that didn't want to tell their wife that, hey, this is what's going on with us. We actually went out and did a contract 
with the, with our um, deferred compensation, and they come to fire stations and put on um, financial training at the fire station. And it's not about how big is my um, um, retirement going to be or how much money do I have over here. A lot of it is just about managing money, managing it every day. Now, some people will say, you know, they're adults. What the heck are you doing being able to do, do these things? And why is it your responsibility to do it? Our feeling is, is if it helps the member do their job every single day and takes away those distractions, then we should be able to, then we'll, then we'll provide that to them. Um, when the um, Yarnell 19 died, which was the wildland fire in northern Arizona, three of the people that were the 19th had gone through the, um, God, I started, I know I was going to do this. He's the radio guy that does financial savings, Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. So our 100 Club came out, and what was different was that we sat down, Phoenix set up an IMT, and we went up there and helped them manage that portion of it. Uh, a guy named Kevin Roach, who did some work with, with you all here, planned every one of the 19 funerals up there and went through it. The three people that had done the Dave Ramsey were totally set up. The 100 Club, which is kind of our police fire sponsor for that area, saw that was going on. Anybody that will go, wants to go through that, the 100 Club will pay for that now for them to go through that financial portion. Um, for our member that, that, that killed himself off duty, what we found was there was a lot of anxiety about that transition from doing this job for 30, 35 years, and then the next day when you wake up, you're a retiree. And what things can we do to build that support to do those things and help people during that retirement side of it? Uh, wellness standards that will be put into the uh, physical examination. Um, protocols for uh, deployment. So we do a lot of FEMA deployments. Uh, for, for myself, when we deployed to Sandy and went up to New York and was there, we were there for 21 days. How do we take care of the people that are gone? But also, how do we take care of everybody that's left at home? And who takes care of those people? Uh, your annual physical now has a mental health portion of it that goes through and talks about how do you feel, what's going on. Part of the people hate, but oh well, it's, it's part of your physical that you're going to have to go through. Uh, incident response protocol for high stress incidents. What we learned really quick was that as a battalion chief, you could be sitting in your quarters and not even know that my company is managing maybe a pediatric drowning or something else that's going on. So we hooked the system so that everybody knows kind of what's going on in there. Peer support teams, um, do some surveys that, are, that go through there every single year, participate in, in surveys, and then the last one was that we had left off until the very end, was the stress that happens in our dispatch center. So one minute they're, they're answering the phone, the next minute they're doing medical help on it, and the next minute we expected them just to pick up the phone after talking to somebody through CPR and start back in again. And we realized, they came to it one day and said, hey, what are you doing about us? And it was like, mm, we missed it. And so we looked at what do we need to be able to do to support that group. We've moved forward, and it goes back to kind of what we talked about before, was that that support is huge at the top. But the organization truly has changed because of people like you all as the company officers. And again, we've had a really bad event that happened, but as a company officer, sitting there on the straddle, and all of a sudden the drug call comes in, or you're sitting there listening, and you can't help but listen when he's arguing with his wife on the phone, or that there's an issue that, that's happening, or he's got a kid that's having troubles and he's not going to school, or there's some other issue that's causing a lot of stress. And taking the time and saying, hey, you know, after work, let's go, let's go have a cup of coffee. Let's figure out what we can do. Let's, let's go and figure out these resources. And that was a hard thing for us, was the resources. In your packet, that number should be in there. Anybody, we'll pay for it, but anybody can call. So one of the things that our people said was that if I had to go and find EAP right now through my medical insurance, I'm not real sure I could find it. And then once I go there, I'm going to have to explain to this person what my job is and what I do or what I don't do. And so what we found is we just need somebody that has training. And, and the military, and I don't know why I'm pointing to you, but the military has been absolutely great. Is that They gave us a bunch of support, and they have gone through just a ton of suicides from people coming back from deployments and trying to engage back in. So they have been great. 
We don't care who calls this. Someone's having a problem. What we've learned is that our average phone call there is about eight minutes. They call, they have some type of deal, they want to talk to somebody, they give them some information on what to do. But we've had phone calls on there that have been up to two and a half hours of people being able to call, work through things. And these people are, are trained people. They pick up one phone at the military, pick up one phone it's for fire. We've actually set it up now that our police officers have a separate line that they can call in too. The website, firestrong.org, again, it's in your, in your packet there. What we went through was we built a website that has all the resources. The only thing that you can't get to on this website is some of the testimonials. Um, I'll look and see what my, uh, I can't remember what my login is, but I'll, I'll give that. But it goes through because we had so many questions about what's going on with me, what's the overview of it, what to expect in counseling, drug addiction, the peer support group. There's a live chat thing where you can go on and chat with police, fire, and military type things. Uh, additional resources, financial fitness, family and relationships, PTSD, depression. Um, and so what our members wanted was they wanted access 24 hours a day without having to go find their packet for EAP or try to dial a number and try to get their 16 things and then go through and try to pick somebody to be able to go to. Peer supports. There's some people that I can't believe are peer supporters on there, but they're some of the greatest people. <laughs> so what we did is we asked people that wanted to be a peer supporter. We screwed up. What we should have done is say, who should be peer supporters? <coughs> we should have had that came the opposite way because people came forward that were, are really good, and then some people that wanted to do it that nobody would go to. But if I asked you all in here as a group, if you had a problem, you had to go talk to somebody, who would you go talk to? you'd be surprised that there's probably about five or six names that continue to pop up. And we, we figured that out to come around the other way to be able to do it. Their impact on our department has been absolutely huge. Is that people have somebody, we've got young guys, now like when a recruit class will go through, they'll identify someone that is a peer supporter in there. Young, middle-aged, old, chief officers, uh, the girl in the light blue there is an alarm room person. We've got all different ranks, all different, anything you can imagine that's in there. And they have done an, out, an outstanding job. Then what they have become is the trainers that go out and do the training annually with everybody in the department. The testimonial. The last thing that we've worked a lot on here lately is about resilience. It's the ability to bounce back and resist uh, and the ability to be strong. I guarantee you this is the last video.
the um, <coughs> what you talked today about is a great way to, to finish it. You think I had kind of planted you to be in here. <coughs> the, the way our, we talked about a lot of stuff today about stations and environments and different things that are happening in there. And it's all really important and we've got to be able to maintain that. But, but we believe, it, and, and we'll put it in writing and make songs and everything about it, the way that you run your fire station and the way people interact and the way they become a team together and the way that they are a family will have a huge impact on their life and then later on in life down the road. And, and it said it and we've researched the hell out of it. My connection to you as a boss, and either you can make my life good or bad, but the ability to have that environment and change that environment is probably one of the best. I mean, take the fire ground out of it. Is that, that that's our key job? Is that fire ground and us managing it? But what we do in that station, day in and day out, will have a key effect on on the rest of their on the rest of their life there. And you saw it there. That environment that happens in the stations, our ability to re resiliency, our diet, our exercise, but really the interaction with our boss. And so what we tell our people, for every one bad thing that happens, we need to praise our people six times. Or look for opportunities to do that. So, thank you all. Any questions or comments? <laughs> I think we were six to one the other way sometimes, too. <laughs> you guys have been great. Thank you for interacting. I'm going to, I've got way too much stuff in there, so I'll change it up for the rest of the people. Um, you guys are a lot like Phoenix firefighters. It was very enjoyable to be here. Uh, I think our departments are very similar, that everybody shows up. They want to do a great job. Uh, we have the ability to do it, and we have some of the strange struggles. Uh, but I don't think it's nothing that we can't all overcome and do every single day. So thank you all for being here. Have a safe day. Thank you.